Go to our Bibles and go to the book of Acts. We've been looking at the Apostle Paul and his life. And last week we came to um, the uh, uh, place in, in chapter 12 where the Bible tells us that in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now, I talked on Sunday about the, the name Christian, the name that we carry. And I want to look at it a little bit in a different light today and how um, what uh, chapter 12, I'm sorry, chapter 11 is where that's found. Chapter 11 in verse number 26. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And... Uh, we are called Christians because we carry the name of Christ. And what we sometimes see in Scripture, or actually we, we see in, in life, people saying, we, in order to be saved, you must call out to the Lord. Even the song we sang, let me, uh, let me open that up. And we sing it, and, and I, I cringe. When, when we sing it, just because of, of uh, I, I understand what the Bible teaches about salvation and what a person must do to be saved. But even in this song, uh, it says a couple of things that it's bother me. Just a minute. Just a minute. There's a couple of things bother me about it, but I'm only going to talk about the one. It's number 232. It's uh, Fill My Cup, Lord. And it says uh, that, uh, he says, uh, uh, if the things this world gave you leave hungers that won't pass away, my blessed Lord will come and save you if you kneel to him and humbly pray. Well, where in the Bible does it say I have to pray? God comes to us and he says, he says, here I am. Just take me. Just accept me. You don't have to pray for me. You don't have to pray in, in order to receive salvation. I've often wondered at what point, even, let me, let me go over some things. I'm going to get to the Bible here, but let me read some things. There's a little booklet that was written probably in 1998. It's called Seven Reasons Not to Ask Jesus Into Your Heart. And I'm going to, I'm going to read three of the reasons. There's others that they gave that, um, you know, it, it, it he doesn't have to give seven reasons. One reason is enough, okay? Here's one reason. It's never found in the Bible, okay? That's reason enough that we don't have to ask Jesus to come into our heart. That's what happens when we believe He does come in. The Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit comes in, but we don't ask Him to come in. He's ready. By the way, you've probably all seen that, that picture of Jesus standing at the door knocking. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Uh, people will say, He's standing at the door of your heart. And they, the reference there is Revelation 3.20. Uh, he's talking to a church, people who are already saved. He's not talking to unsaved people, saying, I'm standing at the door of your heart, knocking. No, He just says, Here I am. And basically, here's, here it comes down to this. Take it or leave it. You accept me or you don't. Let me read some. They, they, you've heard of the sinner's prayer, right? I, I got online. I just picked a couple of them because there, you cannot find in Scripture the sinner's prayer, and so you, you have a many uh, many of them. Okay, let me just read what one a couple of websites said here. This one says, are you ready to pray the prayer, pray the salvation prayer? We are so excited you are ready to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Send us a message to let us know that you prayed the salvation prayer, and we will send you free materials to help you begin your new journey as a Christian. So here it is, the salvation prayer. Father, it is written in your word that if I, by the way, you think about an, uh, an unsaved person who has never prayed, what are they going to? What, how much are they really going to pray if they're going to pray to, for God to save them? Father, it is written in your word that if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that you have raised him from the dead, I shall be saved. Therefore, Father, I confess that Jesus is my Lord. I make him Lord of my life right now. I believe in my heart 
that you raised Jesus from the dead. I renounce my past life with Satan and close the door to any of his devices. I thank you for giving me, uh, for forgiving me of all my sin. Jesus is my Lord and I am a new creation. Old things have passed away, now all things become new. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, that's uh, that last part there too, in Jesus' name, amen. An unsaved person, what does it mean to pray in Jesus' name? Is that the, the salutation at the end of a, uh, it's like a, at the end of a letter, truly yours, in Jesus' name, amen. We all, we, we do it. I, I pray that way. It does sound funny if I, if I didn't to me. If I come to the end of the prayer, I just say amen. But in Jesus' name, and that's what we're dealing with here, the name of Jesus Christ. That's the name we carry. It's the character of Christ. I'm not going to read any more prayers, <laughs> but uh, it's it's there is no sinner's prayer in the Bible, and the Bible never says to ask Jesus into your heart. The Bible teaches believe, have faith in what Jesus Christ has done. That's all there is. That's what it is, and so uh, what it says. And when, even when we come to um, Romans chapter 10, well, let's go over to um, Amos chapter 9, first of all. I think I looked at this last week, but go back to Amos chapter 9. And where is Amos at? In the Old Testament. I know, but it's what? Joel, right after Joel. Joel. Uh-huh. I don't have it. <laughs> you don't have Joel, okay? okay I got Joel. Well, you just, you, if, if you can't get to it very quick, you just wait and I'll read it. Okay, and somebody else will tell me tell me if I'm not reading the right verse, okay? <laughs> so you just you just follow along and we'll listen to what I read out of the Bible, okay? Yeah, Amos chapter that. nine, verse number eleven. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. And of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. Okay, who are those who are called by his name. And so we hear, you hear what we're saying here, what he says, those people, it's as, it's as if, and I even mentioned this last week, or the Sunday, I am called by my name. I am Ken Butler. You, you want to call me Ken Butler? That's me, and that's who I am. Uh, you don't, that those words don't tell you what kind of character I have doesn't tell you what I'm like but when we get to know God we know Jesus Christ and we carry his name we know what character we are carrying what is is who he is with us go over to um, 2nd Chronicles chapter 7 So Amos said, upon whom my name, uh, who are called by my name, right? Which are called by my name. And so 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse number 14. Now remember that this is, God is talking to uh, Solomon here uh, after he built this temple. And so God says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. So who, who's he talking about here? Anybody? If my, who's that? The body of Christ. Okay. Yes and no. Here in this particular passage, he's talking about the Jews. Okay. They are, they are called by his name because he has chosen them. So he says, if my people humble themselves uh, and pray. So my people which are called by my name. So this is what we're looking at. The idea of carrying the name of Christ. Go over to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 13. Very familiar verse and this is where I believe most people will get the idea that you have to call out to God. But look what Paul is actually saying here, for whosoever shall call upon what? The name of the Lord shall be saved. If he meant that you had to call out to the Lord, 
what would he say? For whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. He doesn't say that. He says, call upon the character of God, who God is, what God did, what, everything about God. Take him upon yourself, accept, accept, not accept, <laughs> accept him, receive him uh, for yourself, and place his name upon you. Call, uh, call upon yourselves the name of the Lord by faith. Now, the word... Um, the word to call upon here uh, also is 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 used uh, in Acts chapter. Um, well, where is it? Uh, I think I, I, I we looked at it last week. Remember when when Paul said, um, uh, "I appeal unto Caesar." Remember me talking about that last week. I appeal to Caesar. He's he's calling upon Caesar. He is, he is putting himself under Caesar's authority. So when I put myself under God's authority, I am calling his name upon me. I'm bringing it upon me. The word in Greek, the Greek word, now, how many of you have, have heard of an, all right, this, I know, you, you probably sometimes think, why does, why does uh, Pastor Butler go off on these tangents? But, uh, have you heard of an EpiPen? What's that? <laughs> you haven't heard of one. Okay, I'll explain it. An EpiPen. You know, how many of you you've heard of it? Do you know what it stands for? Okay, it's a it's a like a, a self um, a shot that you give to yourself if you get on get uh, uh, an allergic reaction to something. What it does it it's it uh, injects epinephrine into you. Okay, what's epinephrine? Now we got to go a little farther. It's adrenaline. It's just a form. It's the, another word for adrenaline. You have adrenaline that is made in your body naturally. Now, why? What does this have to do with with this? Well, the word that means to call upon is epikaleomai. Epi, and it, it's the same Greek root. Okay, it means upon. Okay, kaleomai. I always remember kaleo because it sounds like call, to call upon. Okay, so, okay, let's get back to epinephrine. Why is it called epinephrine? Well, it comes from the gland or glands that are upon the nephrons. What is a nephrine? How many of you know what a nephrologist is? No. Bob's the only one. It's a kidney doctor. So the adrenal gland, adrenal gland is upon the kidney, okay? And that is what secretes adrenaline or epinephrine. It's upon the kidney. Okay, so I don't know. Now I don't know. I lost my place here. But uh, epikaleomai means to call upon. And again, it's the same word. Go over to Acts chapter 4. And verse number 36. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas. What did they do? What does it mean? They surnamed Barnabas. What's a, what, how, how could you say it in another way? He's a son of encouragement. Son of encouragement, son of consolation, right? But, but to say that they named him that, they gave him the surname. They called upon Joseph Barnabas. They placed that name upon him. That's the surname is Epikaleomai. It's the same word. So I'm saying all of this to show that it's what when we for whosoever ever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's about calling him upon ourselves, not about calling out to him. So we don't have to call out to Christ. There, the only place that I can I can think of that somebody called out to God uh, in a in a form of I don't even know if he's a way of salvation. We don't even know if it's it's a true account, but Jesus used it, and it was the 
uh, when the Pharisee and the publican prayed, the publican called out and said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Okay, that's when somebody called out to God. Again, it's we don't even know if it really happened. But there is no account. Whenever somebody is saved in the scripture, they're just already, they just are saved because of their faith. They hear the word of God and they accept what the preacher preached. Peter said uh, when he preached, uh, they, they all called out and said to Peter and, and the apostles said, what must we do? And he says, repent and be baptized. Now, that's a whole, another whole story about repent and be baptized. Uh, you don't have to be baptized to be saved, but uh, it seems like it because Peter said that. When Paul and Silas were in prison and the jailer said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Well, call upon the name of the Lord. They didn't say that, did they? What did they say? Believe, right, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. <laughs> Man, that's, that's so clear. And so when we put our faith in Christ, it, we now have what it said about Barnabas. We have a new surname. We are, call, we are calling upon ourselves the character, the person of Jesus Christ. We are now, that's why we are Christians because we carry the name of Christ. Well, the apostles, let's go back to Acts chapter um, 11, and we see after that they have, uh, uh, it says that they were called Christians first at Antioch. Begin at verse number 27 now. It says, And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. Now, by the way, let me go Go back and what is a prophet? What is a biblical prophet? All right, Dave. Okay, you got you got that? Somebody who speaks for God. Not somebody who is telling the future. Okay? Sometimes they do. Sometimes the prophet says this is what's happening in the future. And you can read all over Scripture. It's, they, they talk about that. But they talk about it from God. And that's the main point. They are speaking the words of God. And if it turns out that God says, I want you to know what's going to happen, this is what I'm telling you. And so the prophets came here, it said, from Jerusalem to Antioch. And in this particular case, it, it was telling a, a future thing, what's going to happen. And there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. So the writer, Luke, is writing it after the fact. So he says, at this particular time back then, the prophet came from Jerusalem to Antioch, and he told them that there's going to be a great dearth. What is a dearth? A famine. A famine. There's a, a, not much food, okay? So these people in Antioch believed these prophets, believed Agabus, because look what they did. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now, they trusted Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas and Saul had been uh, there. Remember, Barnabas went to Tarsus to find Saul, Paul, and brought him back to Antioch. How long did they stay there? Anybody? A year. Okay, and so they taught. They ministered. So, they, so here, Paul and Barnabas are ministering in Antioch, and the people, the Christians who are there, are seeing that God is working in Barnabas and Saul. So they trust them. And so when they, they talk amongst themselves, the church, say, let's help the people in Judea. He doesn't say, he said that the dearth was going to be throughout all the world, 
So Antioch was going to be within all the world. There was going to be a great famine there too. But they must have had must have had uh, more means, more there than they did in Judea. So they said, let's take an offering and send it to Judea. And when they gathered together all that they had that they were going to send, then they said to Barnabas and Saul, you take it. Okay, so they went. And uh, then they came back. Let's go jump over to verse number 25 of chapter 12. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So they came back to Antioch from Jerusalem after they delivered the, the gift. And they're back in business in Antioch teaching. See, we as Christians, we talked about that last week, we have a responsibility to teach, not just to present the gospel, but once that gospel has been presented and somebody puts their faith in Christ, we also have a responsibility to help them grow in Christ. So Paul and Barnabas were doing that. We come to chapter 13 and, and we see again that they continue now look at look what it says here. It's not it's not just talking about Barnabas and Paul. Now there were in the church, that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas, and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord, you see that that is not a it's not a beginning. He doesn't say, Luke doesn't say, now they began to minister. What does he say? He says, as they ministered. When did they start ministering, these teachers and preachers? And I believe it's not just the, the, these special teachers. I believe it's the whole church. What, when did they start ministering? Anybody have any idea? When God called them to do it, anointed them to do it, and told them. Okay, at what the at what point at what point in their Christian lives did that happen? I don't know. When they became Christians. When they became Christians. We have all that. have the responsibility to minister. And so as we minister, God directs us. And I, I have used this I know some of you haven't heard the, the, the illustration. My wife has heard it a thousand times probably, even before I became a preacher. As, <laughs> how many of you have ever been able to turn a bicycle without it moving forward? I've seen people balance on them. You know, I tried a unicycle once and I couldn't do it. But people, people get on a bicycle and they can, they can balance it and they can turn it and everything. These trick guys. But the only way I can turn a bicycle is if I'm moving forward. Okay, so as we minister that's when God uses us that's when God says here you're 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 going in the right direction keep going in that direction but I'm gonna have you go this way a little bit or I'm gonna have you turn make a right turn here God directs us as we minister as we live our Christian lives we're not to be sitting still we you remember when when Moses came to the and the children of Israel came to the the Red Sea and they stood there and they're all, we're going to die. The, uh, Pharaoh and his army is behind us. The Red Sea is in front of us. And I, you know, we don't know what was on each side. Sometimes, some people say the mountains on one side and a marshland on the other. We're trapped. What did Moses say to the people? He said, stand still. <clears throat> Okay, sometimes we have to stand still and watch God work. That's what he was saying. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Uh, it's, it's not about being still. I know it says the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. There are people who make a big deal about that, and they turn it into some sort of New Age meditation thing. Be still. Don't do anything and let God work. Let go and let God. God wants us to minister. 
God want, wants us to keep ministering. He'll direct us, and He moves us better because we feel Him. We sense, we sense the direction better as we minister, as we continue. So Paul, here, Paul and Barnabas in Antioch were one of these uh, prophets and teachers. And so in verse 2 it says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So now they're, they're, as they are ministering, now God says, I want Barnabas and Saul to do a special job for me. He doesn't choose anybody else there. He takes Barnabas and Saul. That doesn't mean nobody else did anything and they just sat still. They had a big city there to minister to. They had people all around them that they could witness to. And that is what I believe they did as God called Barnabas and Saul to a particular ministry. Verse number three, And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Now they were, they laid their hands on them was a uh, unnecessary, but I believe that that gave Barnabas and Saul um, encouragement that the people were standing behind them. The people were also appointing them to the ministry. Sometimes we can't go uh, to certain places, but we do send other people. That's why we have missionaries. There are places. You know, if we had enough money, we could send a missionary to every country of the world, but we can't do that. And so we, and we don't go, not because we can't, we don't want to, maybe we can't, maybe God hasn't called us to that, but we give money to help missionaries where we can't go. So the church at Antioch sent out Barnabas and Saul. They didn't even know where they were going. The Holy Spirit said, uh, separate them for the work whereof I have called them. So what did they have to do? They had to trust God. Trust God that God was going to take Barnabas and Saul wherever he was going to use them. And they sent them out. They didn't send them with money. They just sent them out. Paul and Barnabas had to make their way wherever they went. But they trusted God. And that's what we do. We trust God in the business that he has called us to. And for most of us, is being a Christian, carrying the name of Christ, being the person he wants us to be where we are. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Barnabas and Saul. Thank you that Barnabas was the called the son of consolation, encouragement. Lord, that he showed that he cared about Saul and Lord that you use them in a mighty way to establish churches to help churches grow and we have even the letters many of the letters that Paul wrote for the churches that we use because he gives much instruction I thank you so much Lord that we have uh, your word written by the hand of Paul thank you for being with us tonight we ask for your guidance your direction as we go from here. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.